Welcome to our Sunday morning online service of the Faith Bible Baptist Church. I'm sure we all are missing each other in the fellowship and comfort of the church meeting, and yet we're in earnest prayer that this sanction will soon be lifted and the plague abated to the point that we can safely assemble again. In the meantime, we are thankful to God for the opportunity to meet in this unusual way. For now, it will have to suffice us. And so let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this great opportunity to preach the Word of God. We live in a free country, Lord. We can even broadcast this uh, throughout the country through the uh, medium that's provided. So we pray, Lord, that that Word will have its effect in every listener. Help us to be edified and strengthen those that know you, Lord. And if there are those that are listening that are unsaved, that they will be attracted to the, the gospel message so magnetic to the soul that salvation would be their gift today. And they will be happy even for this opportunity in the midst of crisis to hear the liberating word of God. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn this morning reminds us that Jesus is still a friend to sinners.
And our special music is an excerpt from our Tribute of Praise presentation featuring Esther McGuire. But the Word of God predicts the end of all human suffering with the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who shall set up His kingdom on earth. The sky shall unfold, preparing His entrance. The stars shall applaud.
please open your Bibles to Luke 13, 10 through 17. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity eighteen years, and was bowed together, and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, and them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall, and lead him away to watering? And not not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. And so our teaching opens with our Lord addressing a group of worshippers on the Sabbath day in one of the many synagogues then present in Jerusalem. The synagogue was a Jewish religious institution long before Jesus preached in the synagogues at Jerusalem, Capernaum, and Nazareth. The synagogue and its worship services were firmly established among the Jews before they returned from the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century before Christ. The earliest synagogues were known as houses of study, prayer, and assembly. Before any group of Jews could establish a new congregation and build or use a synagogue, they had to have at least had si- Before any group of Jews could establish a new congregation and build or use a synagogue, they had to have at least ten active male members, age thirteen or older, who could constitute a minion or a quorum of worshippers for the services that were to be held three times daily. These members would elect a board of elders who would supervise the religious practices and the communal needs of the congregation. The elders would also appoint the teachers or rabbis and direct the financial affairs of the synagogue. Thus, the synagogue was a democratic, voluntary, and independent institution and each synagogue determines its own needs and practices. This partially explains why there were hundreds of synagogues in Jerusalem during Christ's lifetime. There were also established every place where ten male Jews could gather together. Paul, in his missionary journeys, visited synagogues throughout the Mediterranean area, many of which were established centuries before the birth of Christ. The synagogue services were patterned After some aspects of temple worship, services were held three times a day when the congregations gathered in their prayer houses or synagogues while the priests were offering the sacrifice at the temple. The men and women sat in different sections, with the women usually in the rear or in special balcony sections. This practice was patterned after the custom of separating the women from the men in the court of the women of the temple. The main entrance to the synagogue was on the east side, as with the temple. The holy ark, which contained the Torah and other scriptures, was placed on the wall facing Jerusalem and the temple. A vestibule separated the main synagogue sanctuary from the street so that the thoughts and cares of the outer world would be shed before entering the holiness of the inner sanctuary. Many psalms, prayers, and songs of the synagogue services were patterned after those of the temple. It is plain to see that the modern typical Christian service was patterned after the synagogue order of service. And so here we find our Lord expounding the scripture in his own inimitable style. 
as noted even by his persecutors, no man ever spake like this man. One can only imagine what pearls of supernal wisdom fell from his divine lips. His hearers listened with rapt attention and absorbed the very words of life. I have little doubt that the Master taught extemporaneously. He was the living word, and that word cascaded freely from his mouth in unbroken cadence. I was just musing on this, as I have always enjoyed speaking in a similar manner, though in a crude and stuttering imitation in comparison to the Lord. In this way I would rely on the Holy Spirit to give me my next words. For now I have been forced to organize my thoughts and write them down for this recording. It is a challenge for me from which I hope to soon be released. But, as is often the case with your preacher, I digress. But now, see here a sudden interruption to his lesson. Jesus spies a woman in dire exigency. It is so much like the Savior to prioritize this woman's need, and thus puts the sermon on pause as his great heart of compassion draws him towards this pitiable victim of Adam's curse. No question passes the lips of the heavenly healer, as was sometimes the case. He didn't ask, what would you have me to do? It is not in response to her petition for a blessing, for she is there for no other reason but to take in the ministry of his teaching. She has been resigned to live with a burden that she has now borne for 18 years. But the master came to set at liberty those who were bruised, and so he lays his hands upon her and dispenses the healing while dispersing the curse. Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. In a word, her body liberated, and her life was changed. We must pause here and take in the spiritual implication of this miracle. Here we have a woman bearing a heavy burden for many years. She is stooped and bowed down. Every day the burden seems heavier and harder to bear. This bespeaks the burden of sin that weighs us all down, which innervates and vitiates, and thus sapping us of the joy of life. Jesus knew that man living under the weight of sin needed a deliverer, and so he exclaimed, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sisyphus, a figure of Greek mythology, who was condemned to repeat forever the same meaningless task of pushing a boulder up a mountain, only to see it roll down again. Life without Christ and the hope of heaven is a burdensome weight. In 1949, the French existentialist Albert Camus wrote The Myth of Sisyphus, in which he compares the absurdity of man's life with the situation of Sisyphus. That life is inherently devoid of meaning and consequently absurd, but humans will nevertheless forever search for meaning. From a Christian perspective, John Bunyan in his Pilgrim's Progress depicts the same burden of sin by describing a load on the back of his protagonist, Christian. Upon this way, therefore, did burdened Christian run, but not without great difficulty because of the load on his back, that just as Christian came up to the cross, his burden loosed from off his shoulders and fell from off his back and began to tumble and so continued to do till it came to the mouth of the sepulchre where it fell in and I saw it no more. Then was Christian glad and lightsome, and said with a merry heart, He hath given me rest by his sorrow, and life by his death. And so in our text the woman who bore the heavy burden was loosed by one touch from the great physician. As Psalm 55.22 says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. For every Christian, the sin burden was lifted at Calvary. Our soul has been liberated from the ill and odious effects of the curse. 
though the flesh remains subject to the corruption of Adam's sin. The glad day is coming for complete deliverance from this corruptible carcass that still must bear up under the onslaught of the devil's curse. I see in the text that the woman was loosed and made straight, thus reminding me of the bondage of sin and the need for Christ's liberating powers. Consider some of the plethora of passages that address the release that Christ alone can afford the sinner. In Luke chapter 4, we gave an extended teaching on the mission of Christ when he read the scroll in the synagogue of Capernaum. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. John 8.34 The Lord addresses the inveterate power of sin in a person's life, and then proceeds to give the key to the freedom from this bondage. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Men have sought to provide their effect programs and behavior modification instructions to try to abate the addictive enslavements, and yet it is Christ alone who provides recovery from the sin of the devil. Second Timothy 2, 25-26 tells us, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Charles Wesley put to melodic verse the triumph of Christ's amazing love. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon, flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, and can it be, that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. Woman, thou art forever loosed, and now empowered to live that straight life of godliness. Overcoming, victorious living is the birthright of every believer. We are not to cower and wither under the seductions of the evil one, as some pusillanimous weakling. In the last few Wednesday night Bible studies from 2 Corinthians 10, we have learned to arm ourselves in the mighty power of Christ, to lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, as Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 instructs us, making straight paths for our feet as we follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. As is in the case of this woman of our text, so shall we then give to God all the glory for his great deliverance. Instead of joining in praise to the Lord, the ruler of the synagogue railed against the miracle. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work, and them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was established in principle in the second chapter of the book of Genesis, when God rested on the seventh day, having finished the work of creation. Because of this, God blessed the Sabbath and sanctified it. It is not until Exodus chapter 16 that the seventh day was divinely prescribed as a day of resting from the harvesting of manna. In chapter 20 of Exodus, the Sabbath became the focus of the fourth commandment. Keeping this day holy required that the Israelites finish their week's work 
by the end of the sixth day, so that the seventh could be a day in which men abstained from the normal occupations of the other six. In Exodus chapter 31, the keeping of the Sabbath was declared to be a sign of the Mosaic covenant, with the death penalty prescribed for any violator of this commandment. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, further clarification was given regarding the keeping of this commandment. Sabbath rest was further defined in terms of changing conditions. Even the land was to have its rest every seventh year. Further, the emphasis shifts from a cessation of normal activities to the ways in which the Israelite should worship God on the Sabbath. The prophets pointed out abuses of the Sabbath and urged the Israelites to keep the Sabbath in spirit and truth. The nation was warned that persistent disregard of the sanctity of the Sabbath would lead to the judgment of being thrust from the land and sent into captivity. We have seen throughout the Old Testament an ongoing clarification and expansion of the Sabbath commandment. During the 400 years of silence between the two testaments, a great deal of attention was given to the interpretation of the law and of the Sabbath. The detail to which the inspired writers went was nothing compared to the embellishments performed on the Sabbath commandment by the Jewish scholars and religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees. We would not be correct to conclude that all of these efforts to clarify the law are senseless. While the method of interpretation may be wrong, not to mention the conclusions reached, there was ample motivation for probing the obligation of the individual Israelite to the fourth commandment. During the Maccabean period, a century before Christ, 1,000 Jews had been slaughtered because they were attacked on the Sabbath and would not break the Sabbath to defend themselves. Little wonder, then, that Jewish scholars sought to clarify the Sabbath commandment. A large body of teaching regarding the interpretation of the Sabbath thus began to emerge before and after the coming of Christ. These interpretations were first preserved and passed on as oral traditions, and then later put into writing. In the 3rd century AD, a written compilation of the oral traditions of the scribes was completed. It was known as the Mishnah. It contained 63 tractates on various subjects of the law, requiring about 800 pages in English. Later, Judaism set itself to the task of interpreting these interpretations. These commentaries on the Mishnah are called Talmuds. Of the Jewish Talmud, there are 12 printed volumes. Of the Babylonian Talmud, there are 60 printed volumes. The law lays it down that the Sabbath is to be kept holy and that on it no work is to be done. That is a great principle, but these Jewish legalists had a passion for definition. So they asked, what is work? All kinds of things were classified as work, as to carry a burden on the Sabbath day is to work. But next, a burden has to be defined. So the scribal law lays it down that a burden is, quote, food equal in weight to a dried fig, enough wine for mixing in a goblet, milk, enough for one to swallow, honey, enough to put upon a wound, oil, enough to anoint a small member, water, enough to moisten an eye salve, enough to write a customs house notice upon, ink, enough to write two letters of the alphabet, read, enough to make a pen. So they spent endless hours arguing whether a man could or could not lift a lamp from one place to another on the Sabbath, whether a tailor committed a sin if he went out with a needle in his robe whether a woman might wear a brooch or false hair, even if a man might go out on the Sabbath with artificial teeth or an artificial limb, if a man might lift his child on the Sabbath day. These things to them were the essence of religion. Their religion was a legalism of petty rules and regulations. We can hardly be surprised to find a head-on collision between the scribes and Pharisees and our Lord over the issue of the Sabbath. The Gospel writers record numerous occasions 
when the Jewish religious leaders clashed with Jesus over the interpretation of the Sabbath. Almost always, this resulted from an incident in which our Lord violated the Sabbath, according to their legalistic teachings and interpretations of the scribes and Pharisees. In the study of Luke 6, we found that the Pharisees were in conflict with Jesus regarding the healing of the man with the withered hand. Jesus silenced the critics by posing the question, Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? Up to this point, Jesus had been scrupulous as far as the Torah is concerned and had not clashed even with the Sabbath regulation of the Halakha. The Halakha was designed to put a fence around Torah, people free to perform necessary tasks, and in the majority view, acts of mercy. It is doubtful that any consideration was given in the early stages to the legitimacy of Sabbath miracles, since the regulations dealt with work on the Sabbath. If the Halakha comments about healing were intended to govern medical practitioners and the ministrations of relatives and the like, It is hard to see how Jesus committed any offense at all. It appears then that Jesus' Sabbath practices were not reviled by anyone at first a mount, and Jesus himself was reviled. At that point, the Sabbath legislation was used against him, and attacks against him were rationalized on the basis of the halakha. It should be abundantly clear that the sabbatical law was assigned to the Jewish people, Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. It had no significance to the Gentiles that would later be added to the church upon Jesus' ascension to heaven. Christ blotted out the ceremonial aspects of the law by fulfilling the typology. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And so it follows that no man would now be judged by the keeping of the Sabbath or any feasts of the Old Testament, seeing that Christ has fulfilled what they meant to represent. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Paul later rebuked the Galatian Gentiles for trying to keep the ceremony after it had lost its efficacy. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known of God, How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. So we see New Testament believers would now congregate on the first day of the week in celebration of the rest that we have entered into through the finished work of the cross. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, 
Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay. Come into